This is another interesting edition of the Economy and Politics show where we bring you key economic developments as it affects the households. This edition will discuss rising inflation, devaluation, and implication for Nigerian households. And my guest is Dr. Tope Fashua, an economist and public policy analyst. Nice to have you, Dr. Tope. Uh, uh, good morning, Otto. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Yes, thank you very much. Great to have you. But before we begin the discourse today, let us give you some recap of economic stories from last week. The International Monetary Fund Executive Board, in conclusion of its Article 4 consultation with Nigeria, called for significant domestic revenue mobilization, including by further increasing the value-added tax rates, improving tax compliance, and rationalizing tax incentives. It also urged the removal of untargeted fuel subsidies with compensatory measures for the poor and transparent use of saved resources. IMF stressed the importance of further strengthening social safety nets in the country. Also last week, many filling stations were shut, and this led to queues by motorists in the few outlets that dispense premium motor spirit, popularly called petrol, in Abuja and neighboring states, as well as in parts of Lagos. It was then that the marketers of PMS were still unsure about moves to halt petroleum subsidy, considering the fact that the government had projected in 2021 that it would stop early this year. According to uh, reports from media, some members of the National Association of Road Transport Owners had discontinued operations in protest against the low freight rate for petrol, which they received from government. We go on a break, and when we return, the conversation will continue. Tune in to Web TV Daily to stay up to date and informed on the financial market, personal finance, and more. We have got you covered with all your favorite TV shows, economy and politics, market review, Women's Series, Millennial Talk, Islamic Finance Weekly, The Brief, Exclusive Interviews, Events, and we keep you up to date on all the updates in the financial market with the Market Opening Gong. Watch premium content. Watch Web TV. Same news, different perspective. Welcome back. If you are joining us, it is the Economy and Politics Show, and we are looking at rising inflation, devaluation, and implications for the Nigerian households. And our guest is Dr. Tupe Fashua, an economist and public policy analyst. Dr. Tupe Fashua, nice to have you once again. And let's first look at the implications of the rising tide of inflation and currency devaluation on Nigerian households and their purchasing power this period. Right. Uh, so the... Um, you know, the problem we have with inflation in Nigeria, and I think we have two problems. Uh, one, of, one of them is that it goes in leaps and bounds. So I think we've been living the reality of a hyperinflation for too long, uh, even in peacetime. You know, what other countries would have in wartime, we have in peacetime. So oftentimes you see that I talk about uh, the fact that we're at war, um, this time an economic war. And so our policies needed to be wartime policies. Our, our, unfortunately, those policies are not designed as such. And uh, we take it easy. We behave as if you know, everything is all fine and so on. So we've been living that, that um, hyperinflation reality. When I looked at uh, across the board, inflation of staple items, including rent, including food and all of that, yeah. since uh, 2015 to date, I was seeing something like 300, 350, 400, 500 percent. And I'm wondering, okay, so how many people have their salaries increased by this much? Yeah. And then when you consider um, devaluation again, the fact that a lot of things we buy are foreign in nature, that adds to the inflation, the imported inflation uh, aspect of it. So you wonder how Nigerians are even surviving at all. I don't know, what that means is that a lot of people are dropping into the poverty net every day according to the World Poverty Index. And Nigeria is perhaps the only country, or maybe after, you know, we add maybe Congo to the Republic, uh, DDR Congo, uh, Chad, Niger, um, uh, you know, even Mauritania and Sudan have now been listed as countries that are net net taking their people out of poverty. So you see where we are, all right? So apart from the uh, fact that our, our poverty is, our inflation is, um, <coughs> Uh, our inflation is, um, you know, hyperinflation and always moving in leaps and bounds. It's also multidimensional. So 
on one hand, you have a scenario where, okay, because of the stag stagnant economy, the government is trying to intervene. And so they are giving money uh, to people there and there. That money is not backed up by any increased productivity. The money just goes straight into the, uh, into the market and increases inflation because it's not backed by increased productivity. Uh, at the same time, on the supply side, you see that companies also are under a lot of pressure from everywhere. I think they are imputed, a lot of the inputs are foreign. And of course, the Naira has been devalued. And so they have to mark up their prices. You know, So on the supply side, they're getting inflation. On the import side, they're getting inflation. On the demand side, they're getting inflation. I mean, so it's a perfect storm, really. And so uh, what's the effect on the average Nigerian home? The point is that uh, very few people are lucky to be at the top of the echelon whereby they are producing goods that they can increase their prices any time of day. I think the only people who are really enjoying this thing are the few people, maybe the few government parasitals who have managed to increase their salaries and are moving lockstep with inflation or a little bit higher than inflation, and they're sitting on top of the pack. Yeah, and, and the rest of people are struggling, including those in the place. The banks are laying off as many as possible. And, you know, they, at the end of the day, they'll end up with a few elite core officers who they can afford to pay any amount of money. And the rest of the people are running to Canada. Uh, so, I mean, all of this is, uh, you can see right there, uh, is, is in very plain view that we, Nigerians are even ready to chip in themselves to take any job, to go anywhere, anywhere in the world. Um, I was listening to someone today say that if Neverland, Neverland, Neverland is Michael Jackson's little uh, enclave. You know, if Neverland was a country and the you know they had they had embassies, the Nigerians will run to Neverland. They run to anywhere. So apart from the local effects of these issues, okay. Um, and I mentioned that uh, you know to a large extent we see a lot of strain on family units now, um, gender-based violence, domestic violence, uh, emotional violence from women to men as a result of the failures of men. Um, you know, and of course, relationships are breaking down. Um, young people who should get into relationships are not getting into those relationships because of fear, or they are basically just philandering and behaving. You know, and 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 the rest of the people uh, at the top of the echelon. I mean, I mentioned the bank bank sector and other sectors of the economy that seem to be doing well. Uh, those ones are laying off and casualizing the lowest. Uh, part of their, their, their staff, okay? And they casualize, they only use you once in a while. You have no career. You end up doing the same little thing for the next 10 years, you no know, improvement, and all, nobody cares about you. And, uh, you know, the rest of the people uh, articulate are also uh, migrating abroad to any country at all that will take them. And in fact, I just came back from abroad a couple of days back, uh, specifically UAE. And I found out that, the, the, of course, the few Nigerians that are left there are, are busy washing toilets. You don't see them as toilets or, or as security men. You, you know, you hardly see them in um, very good positions. They are canceling Nigerians' visa mm -hmm. because, you know, we seem to be moving in the hordes now. Mm -hmm. We're moving uh, en masse, you know. So they are canceling Nigerians' visa. We basically devalued ourselves, even as our currency was devaluing, the people were devaluing as well. Yeah. I mean, the issue you raised about the UAE and migration, I, I understand that the Federal Ministry of Foreign Affairs are trying to work out modalities to address those concerns in terms of skill level uh, in, 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 in countries like that. But uh, everything revolves around economic strategies, national development plans. We now have 2021 to 2025 ruled out. Is there a headway to this in addressing the socioeconomic challenges that, like you rightly said, is fueling poverty and social vices in the country? Right. Uh, you mentioned uh, the economic uh, development plan. Fine. I mean, luckily, we've just gone back to the idea of uh, development planning again. And uh, there seems to be a development plan that was articulated uh, a few months ago, which sort of incorporates the private sector uh, contribution. I've critiqued that development plan in another forum. And one of the surprising things for me is that uh, you know, I thought that that plan should be bigger than that. If I remember, we were talking about a 400 and uh, uh, about almost you know, about 450 billion uh, dollars kind of plan. And, and so on. the private sector contributions about 89% of it. Uh, and the federal government, I mean, the government, uh, public sector, it tends to contribute about 
hundred and hundred and uh, hundred and ten uh, billion dollars uh, thereabouts. If I you and it's a five year plan, yeah. And uh, my observation was that uh, the com the contribution, if I'm correct, uh, of the federal government comes to an average of ten trillion naira every month. I mean, every every year, and I felt that this was even below the budget, uh, the budget as we know it now, which we are looking at seventeen trillion. Yeah. If that uh, development plan is collating the GDP of the country, meaning that the goods and services produced in the country, I think that the esti estimate from the for the public sector, I, I mean, that has been underestimated already. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, when they do this kind of budget in the public sector at some point, they try to be cautious. Ah, let's not put too much so that people will not expect too much from us. Uh, you know, and that's the point at which people should intervene and say, no, do put those things, you know, plan those things, put all the figures on the table. Because a budget is a very dangerous thing. It's the most important um, document, including economic plan, yeah, in a country in a given year. It can either be used to stymie the economy, to hold the economy down, or be used to inspire more productivity in the economy. Yeah. Okay, and so a budget is so important that you cannot leave it to the people in the government, uh, the public sector alone. Everybody must chip in. You know. So uh, regarding that, and you mentioned the um, what's going on in the UAE. Unfortunately, I think it's a much more uh, endemic situation uh, as it pertains to Nigeria. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, you know that the UAE was our last bastion, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I went to the World Expo in the UAE, the Expo 2020. Yeah. I saw that Nigeria was uh, forgotten in the sidelines. Um, only countries like Egypt, to a lesser extent, South Africa, had pavilions that could inspire anything. Yeah, yeah, Egypt was what I saw, and of course, not only Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco, those northern Af African countries are setting themselves apart today. And you go to most African countries, you know, pavilions, all you are seeing are uh, hides and skin and, um, you know, some primitive living and some animals. You no know. materials. In Nigeria, in, fact, in Nigeria pavilion, we did not display those animals, okay? But what? Well, we didn't display anything as well. Um, the only thing that was significant is the music. Uh, I found out that there was nowhere that lovers of Nigeria music could even come and say, oh, let me quickly download this. Or there was no way of pushing them in that direction of, oh, patronize our music, patronize our Nollywood and all of that, or whatever it is we thought we, we had. And we just were not very serious. Where other countries were taking whole buildings, and I'm saying Tunisia, Morocco, uh, um, Egypt, they took whole buildings, all right? In that place, uh, Nigeria was sharing uh, with uh, with Cyprus, or one other country of that sort, you know, we're sharing a building and all of that stuff. So uh, it's a perennial thing that um, our, our, our young people have been seen to, apart from the issue of crimes and cyber crimes and all the misdemeanors that some of them have uh, contributed, con you know, con uh, committed over time, which is blowing back in everybody's faces. Uh, in general, I don't see anything very significant. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs have proven to be only reactive, not proactive, okay? We're not projecting ourselves and our, 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 our labor and our children. We're not projecting them in the, right, in the right light. I think at best, many of those people who also have their children abroad, Nigerians are only just taking care of themselves. The minister is taking care of himself. Those people are just taking care of themselves and their family. Nobody is thinking corporately for Nigeria. Nobody is talking about changing the rhetoric. And of course, it's so unfortunate because right from the number one person in the country down the rank, the rank and file, I can't see that vision, okay? That, that vision, that passion that can say, listen, let's reposition this country. Oh, we've made mistakes. Are we admitting those mistakes? Who's there? Um, you know, talking to our young people, our youths and so on, who is there mm -hmm. inspiring them? Who is there even showing the example? All right. So um, if, if, like I said before, Nigeria is at war, economic war, who, who is living as if we're at war? Mm -hmm. Okay. If, if, if we're at war, you will not be there looking for how to buy the latest car from abroad. And, all. and that's what they did for the past seven years. Every, every other year you see in every budget, you see all those unnecessary purchases, all those unnecessary foreign travels and luxury billions get allocated, you know, for food in, you know, in the villa or wherever and all of that at the state level. In fact, total opacity, Lagos State used to publish their um, budget and their accounts before no more. 
No more. And, and you know, I tell you what, if you went to just South Africa here, if you Google as you're sitting down there, you Google Johannesburg City Budget, all right? You yeah. will see, including their accounts for the year. You had a city, which is not even a region, it's not a state, it's just a city, maybe three, four, five million people yes. live in there. And they have a budget of about two trillion naira every year, if not more now, okay? Which is a lot more than the budget of Lagos with 20 something million people and all. So we've been deceiving ourselves uh, for too long. I hope we get out. So, but regarding this issue, I think there's a deliberacy policy that needs to be taken to assist um, the uh, skilled Nigerian youths everywhere. And on skilled youth, mm. on skilled youth should be should be should be uh, mandated and, and encouraged to stay at home and build their skills. So yeah. when we are migrating abroad, we're migrating properly. And when we get there, we know, okay, we, 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 we're migrating with respect. And when we get there, we are getting, we are earning good money, not as toilet cleaners or street sweepers, you know, and, and you know, because those yeah. kind of, those kind of uh, careers and bitter, those who go like that, they get very embittered back home and, and they begin to say, let's break up that country. Nigeria has done this to me and all of that. A lot of people go there thinking that they will get something good and they end up in those kind of careers. Okay, uh, th th that's very clear, um, Dr. Fashua. And then the, when it comes to policy again, this is sure of the petroleum subsidy, like we read from the recap of uh, uh, last week, we've had this lingering issue of removing it now or not, and economists believe that the decision to extend it by 18 months was more political than an economic consideration. Uh, can we afford another 18 months extension? What are the implications again uh, at this time? Invariably, uh, um, um, you know, the decision to extend that um, petroleum subsidy thing um, it was existential. It's not political. It's existential. It's, it's, it's either you are removing it without any backstops and any reasonable um, hedge for the society. And at the end of the day, this country is going to collapse mm -hmm. under the weight of the kind of demonstrations that will come. Yeah. Okay, of course, you can see now we had our answers in 2020, October, mm. and uh, even the countries that were that our people were reporting government to, like Canada, like uh, France, and who that our uh, young people were reporting government to and say, Oh, come and see what they're doing. They're As I am speaking to you, <laughs> Canada has outlawed honking on the street, yeah. they have you know outlawed the freedom people who are saying people. no to, to sure. mandate COVID. France has banned them you know, five hours before they said they were going to come, they banned them and they said that they should go and obtain police permits to demonstrate mm. in this in the land of freedom and egalitarianism, which is what yeah. France calls itself. So the government weighed it and they had um, some, uh, some, some security reports that told them very clearly that if they are there to go down that direction, uh, perhaps it will be the end of the government. The problem with ending a government in that guise, in that manner, is what do you replace it with, which was where I differed from NSAS, okay? So uh, some people were very ambitious with NSAS and felt that, look, hey, okay, no, okay forget NSAS, it's end, worry, end Nigeria. But the point is, you don't replace some sort of order um, mm -hmm. with total anarchy, okay? So yes, so so that's it. So they, they, it was existential to Nigeria because uh, for several reasons, I wrote an article also in that respect that I think uh, where we are right now, given all the mistakes we have made uh, uh, with this situation, um, I don't see any government that will be able to, to remove that wealth subsidy uh, thing uh, in, in a long while in this country. If ever. Why, and, 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 yes, they're not going to be able to do it because, uh, okay, remember, remember also that twice this government said they removed the same subsidy. All right, twice. When they moved the price from 97 to 145, yeah. you know, they said, oh, we've removed it. And I was okay, no, and nobody even whimpered. Nobody even made a noise. We said, oh, Buhari is supposed to be a man of integrity. He has done with what he needed to be done. But you know what they did not reckon with? They did not reckon with devaluation. Yeah. So the same government is pushing devaluation and floating of currencies, okay, as floated by the head of the Economic Council, which is the vice president, given that President Buhari himself has no opinion per se on this issue. What we only hear from Buhari is, I will never devalue the currency. I will never devalue the currency. Okay, what are you going to do? So you have to take a position. So the vice president took a position on that. And we devalued from 
uh, officially 199, which was what Jonathan, the President Jonathan left, with the value to 306 of it. Their own rate was 306. That 306 was only available to people in the villa, all right? And, and, and their cutlery, whoever it is that it was. The rest of the people had to deal with 360, mm -hmm. okay? And of course, the black market moved to about, uh, before then, the black market had gone to about 525 in 2016. They receded a bit, maybe about 450, thereabouts, and so forth. Uh, so that devaluation took place. So what the people, what the government did not reckon with was the effect of devaluation on, on the on the landing part price of, 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 of petrol. Yeah. And so that's why the fact that you said you are devalued, I mean, that you are deregulated down to, uh, you know, 145. By the time crude oil prices, and that was when crude oil price was at 20, yeah. 20, in, it's a slump in 2016, mm -hmm. 20, 20, 30, thereabout. By the time crude oil prices moved up to about 60, 70, we, we saw that there was already a problem because the landing price of bringing crude oil after the devaluation to 360 did not make sense again. And it was like, you needed to, de you needed to deregulate again. And so they moved prices to 162. Mm -hmm. So tell me for how long. Now, so if you're talking about moving, deregulating, and you're talking about a certain price, okay? That price, how long can it hold in the face of continuous devaluation of the currency or even the so-called floating. Now, when you float the, 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 the Naira, you see what we are not reckoning with is also that, you know, there's gonna be a few people, people, you know, institutional investors, money people, you know, FX traders at a large level. We're not talking about all these ones that deceive themselves in Nigeria and lose money. We're talking about institutional investors that trade FX, okay? The kind of positions they will take to shut the Naira knowing from fundamentals that this currency is not going anywhere. This currency is only being held down now because we're in a managed floating system where the central bank can intervene from time to time, you know, maybe ban a couple of things and say, no, let's slow down the economy. If you, if you leave that to market forces entirely and say, let everything that will happen tomorrow happen, what will happen is that these channel investors, the banks, the foreign banks, and of course the local banks will move into that space and we move against the Naira. And at the end of the day, the Naira will float into oblivion. And as it floats into oblivion, so also with the price of petrol float into oblivion. Okay. So if you are talking about 302, as proposed by the same National Economic Council headed by Shivadu uh, about a couple of weeks back before the government backtracked, that 302 was just a stopgap. The, the two things will happen. So you're gonna to have to face up with um, the fact that the, the 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 price itself will continue to be dictated by the price of the naira versus the dollar, and if you're floating the currency, what it means is, like I said before, every institutional investor, every market player, every speculator, every every arbitrageur, they have every incentive to continue to short the naira, to move against the naira, and the naira will continue to fall, and as the naira falls. So also with the price of petroleum continue to rise and in, including every other item that is imported, including inputs into the manufacturing sector in this country, including food. So people don't know what they're toying with. And, and, and you know, it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of baloney gets spoken everywhere. I just look, but well, you know, those are the people that government listens to in the economic council and what have you. Those are the people that they listen to. People who will never tell them the truth. People who are so much in bed with these same institutional investors that when things go all right in this country, they just, you see that they keep quiet. They've been laughing. All of these people have, you know, other passports of different countries. They are not even Nigerians per se. They belong to other countries. It's, it's plain to see. It's a mistake of a lifetime, okay, that was made by the government, okay, and their advisors in not considering the effect of devaluation on 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 deregulation of the of the of the downstream market okay so and that's why they devalue i mean they deregulated at some point 145 but that deregulation could not hold minding the fact that deregulation is actually a point where the government should not state the price at all yes. okay that's that's a, when you go out today whatever it is you see you buy uh -huh. number one number two is also a scenario where the issue of equalization you know, is confined to the dustbin. 
Hmm. Well, I'm not talking about, oh, the, the, you, you expect that the price that you will buy in a papa, which is closer to the point at which the discharge imported petrol should be a little bit cheaper than what you will buy in Egbeda Akowajo or in, uh, so, uh, you know, in Shongotedo or in Ibadan. Mm. And, and, and certainly it will be much more expensive in Joss. Are we ready for that? The government is not ready for that political decision. Okay, so so that's one. And I said that also, aside from uh, from from the issue of you know, by the time the, the, the crude oil price went from 2030 to 60, gaps started occurring again. Landing price became high, much higher than the pump prices, which the government was trying to hold down. You know, and they've done that twice now. And I'm saying that it is going to be almost impossible for any government to be able to hold on to that, especially because we're also pursuing the the policy of of floating the naira. The CBN said today, at some point, you stop selling even to the to the banks. Okay, so you are looking at, hey, what's going on? Is this going to be another major devaluation? Oh, God, you know, I mean, the economic situation of this country blows my mind, and the mistakes we have made and are continuing to make, you know, it's just it's just egregious. I can't. It, unfortunately for me, I'm too old to go and start over in another country now and start to be a security man and all of that. Yeah, nobody will employ me. But I've left, you know. But so, and I say that also, you have to consider the arbitrage issue also. People are saying that Nigerian uh, petrol gets smuggled into the, all these other countries. The price in, in Ghana is about 450 equivalent, 450 Naira, meaning that 302 or whatever it is we wanted to achieve is just a stopgap. We should be looking at 450 in Ghana. We should be looking at 600 Naira in Congo Republic or something. So Nigerians should raise up for a seven, 800 Naira uh, per, per liter price. Um, until then, we will not start stop talking about, oh, now, uh, the petrol that I brought into this country has uh, been taken uh, out of the country. So it's a major, major issue. I'm not sure we're ready to even engage with this, uh, even in government circle. It's just unfortunate. And uh, lastly, on the issue of fiscal policy. So the fiscal domain, you talk about government expenditure, you, or if that thing, you talk about government expenditure, you talk about taxes, okay, um, and government revenue in general. That's the, the domain of fiscal policy, all right? So government expenditure, lock it down. Unfortunately, we could not do zero big budgeting. This government started with it at some point, they had to abandon it, you know, even under Kevin Adosh before she left. So we can't do zero based uh, budgeting, okay? So what are we doing? We're back to envelope system. Ministries, departments, and agencies are giving an envelope and say, my friend, go and spend that one. So when you have that kind of thing, there's a, um, shouldn't you buy a new car in this department this year? Shouldn't we build a new building? There are government agencies that are still building new. I was somewhere I saw the building that ITF is constructing, or massive building here in a, in a, in a Metama here. You know, I'm thinking we think we should be talking about government reducing the fiscal space in which they they exist. This is uh, was supposed to be as a result of COVID to be shrinking spaces, working more from home, doing things differently. We're not seeing that. So we're still thinking about all of this kind of spending. So government expenditure, you can look at it in that regard. I mentioned all those unnecessary luxury purchases, luxury travel that these are people who go through. Buhari still budgeted about 3 billion Naira to travel this year. And during COVID, everybody was locked down. We saw that they could do without those trips. Yeah. All right, so government, that's what the government should be doing. Mrs. Aisha, I mean, sorry, Zena Ahmed, you know, she 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 struggles. She, 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 she I've listened to her a couple of times. She seems to be trying, but that kind of woman will be overwhelmed by political forces that will insist that this is the way they want to go. This is what they want to spend on. The only person that can stop them is the president, who unfortunately is not interested in stopping that. So you talk about that. Then you talk about government revenue. We have been talking about having a revenue problem, which is true that we have a revenue problem. And I see a lot of pushback from organizations like MAN, like LCCI and all of that, who have actually constituted themselves, unfortunately, into activists against you know, some of the, even the policies that can move this country forward. All of us have to pay more, but as we pay more, we should get a moratorium on some sort of spendings. Mm -hmm. We should not be borrowing money for transactions that cannot repay themselves, or at least repay themselves to a certain extent. You have to be able to see the cash flow, okay, coming from it. We, we are borrowing to go and teach, to go and build village schools. No, you should build village schools from internally generated revenue. You should provide water for people in the villages from internally generated revenue. That's how you should be. You don't borrow money for things like that. 
even the rail system, yes, you can borrow from that, you know, uh, for, for that kind of a project, okay? But you have to also be careful. Of course, most rail systems around the world are not run for profit. You know, it's a way of government just incentivizing the system. But, you know, if you look at what you've done so far, we are not even keying in into that. The governors are not, are not you know, collaborating with the federal government to take some of those rail lines into their own state of that. Because the entire thing is tepid. So there's a lot of work for us, but everybody must be ready to pay back. There's the VP of the school out um, elite consensus at some point. Unfortunately, nobody followed up on that. So, um, yeah, and this is one of the most critical issues for us to achieve to, to achieve anything in this country. I think the major takeaway from you is that uh, there seems to be no seriousness on how government plans to move the country to that era of uh, fuel subsidy removal stage. So for now, you think that in the next future, that may not happen until we're very serious about that. And uh, that's food for thought for our fiscal policy the multi policy authorities and all stakeholders. We have to get serious because the times are quite dire. Thank you very much, Dr. Tope Fashwa, for the time and the conversation, public policy analyst and economist. And even on the 14th, today is the 14th of February, Valentine's Day, inflation and uh, devaluation will even influence how uh, couples and those uh, loved ones who spend and uh, purchase things, but whatever it is. Just get something very cool, a good gift. I appreciate the ones that yeah, you love in this period. That will be all for this edition of Economic and Politics Show. If you have questions, comments, or suggestions on rising inflation, devaluation, and implications for Nigerian households in 2022, please send them to tobasi.com at prosheng.com. Also join our website, www.prosheng.com, to read our latest news articles, stories, and reports on the Nigerian economy. You can engage us via our social media platforms displayed on the screen. So you come your way again. Thank you for watching and have a lovely Valentine's Day.